Hello everyone, I'm Linda Nickel, and welcome to another session of my Happiness Hour. My goal here is to help us all connect, inspire, and create. We do this every Wednesday night, live here on Zoom, with a new topic and a new speaker. On Tuesdays, I post the list of upcoming presentations to my Instagram, which is at Cousin Linda, and on my website at lindanickel.com. And that's where you're going to find all the previous sessions that are linked to YouTube. Erin Randall is joining us from Montana, and she is here to keep me on track. So say hello, Miss Erin. Hello, Miss Erin. <laughs> <laughs> we do this every week. She cracks me up. Okay, so our guest this evening is Kenneth LaRose, who is joining us from Washington tonight. Kenny and his pup, Sabu, call, call a 16-foot Airstream home and the spot it's parked in is their playground. As a landscape and nature photographer, Kenny travels across the United States with the seasons, allowing him to be at incredibly beautiful spots during the most spectacular light. But after the sun sets, the stars come out to play, and so does Kenny. So tonight, he's going to help you take your astrophotography to the next level. In this session, Kenny will share his tips on, on scouting for the perfect composition of the night sky and a few advanced post-processing techniques. So Kenny, welcome to the Happiness Hour community. And I, I, I've said this a couple of times and I hope that you realize it, but I really do appreciate that you're coming on here to join us and um, you're willing to share your art and your expertise. So with that, welcome to the Happiness Hour. Ah, oh, well, thank you for such a warm Texas welcome. <laughs> and thank you, Aaron, for being back uh, in the background and, and um, helping out and, and creating this wonderful platform for people to come and join. This is my first happiness hour, but um, mostly because I travel full time, like, like Linda was saying. I live in a tiny airstream. It's less than 100 square feet. I've been doing it for about three years now. Uh, just under three years. I live with my dog and we're just constantly on adventure to adventure to, to adventure. Um, I'm also a teacher. I teach photography. I teach workshops all over the place. And um, so this is my passion. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here and share with, uh, share with the class here, whatever, um, whatever I can. And hopefully you get something out of it. If not, maybe I make you laugh a couple of times, but um, I have some photos I'm going to show you uh, that will showcase all the different types of, of night photography uh, that Linda was going over. We've got the stacked and tracked and some of this stuff might sound foreign to, to you all, but I'm going to explain what each one is and, and why I do it. Focus stacking. There's lots of, there's so many different ways to photograph the night sky. And uh, I guess the first topic that I can go into is the scouting part of things, which I was talking to, to Linda about this. And it, it's funny because people who know me know that I'm, I'm not much of a planner. I'm, I, I, don't, I don't plan a whole lot of my trips. I, don't, I barely know where I'm gonna sleep every night. So it's, um, so photography for me is about, is about adventure and, and finding and capturing moments that are are happening in real time like I, I i rarely i rarely research a place uh for for photographs or for inspiration because i want to go to these places and be surprised and have my own spin on things my own creative spin so uh, so people laugh when 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 they travel with me because i it'll be a, a very popular place and i i won't know what it looks like because just want my creative juices to be fresh and not not be persuaded by something that I've seen before and so with night photography <clears throat> it's a little bit interesting because because there has to be some type of planning involved it doesn't have to be but for the most part you've got the Milky Way that rises in a certain in a certain area the core that's visible a certain time of the year and so there's a season there's a season for Milky Way shooting and um, well, right now we're at the tail end of it, which is a very sad time for me because we're about to say goodbye to the Milky Way core for a bunch of months. But, um, 
Let's see. I'm going to look and see. Uh, okay. So I'm going to open up a folder here and share my screen with you guys. And I'm going to share with you some, some images and some are going to be stacked. And um, when I say stacked, we're using, if you're a PC user, you're using Sequator more than likely. Uh, if you're a Mac user, then you're using Starry Landscape Stacker. And what stacking is, is you're taking five to 25 images of the same composition at the same settings of the night sky. And then you're taking those images and you're putting them through this program and it's stacking them on top of each other uh, through the program and it's eliminating noise in between each of the stars. So it basically takes the light from the stars and it stacks them all on top of each other. And then the space in between each, the, each of the stars, which is typically the noise because you're, you're photographing at a high ISO. And I'll, I'll share with you guys um, the different types of settings that I use for that. But um, just for this purpose, for stacking, you're using a high ISO, maybe 10,000, maybe 12,800. Uh, something really high, maybe 8,000. It's going to depend on the light pollution that's in the sky. Uh, so sometimes, like I was in Phoenix and I was shooting, or outside of Phoenix in the Superstition Mountains, and I was shooting at 4,000 ISO, which is really low for me, or 5,000 ISO, which is really low. I typically, typically like to shoot around 10,000 ISO um, because I can get more color and uh, more detail in the Milky Way. And then I can eliminate that noise through stacking, through Sequator, through Starry Landscape Stacker. Um, so I'm going to show you guys, let's see, I can share this screen, right? Right, Linda? Mm -hmm. The green button down at the bottom. Okay. All right, let's share it. And I didn't say this earlier, but if you guys have any questions for Kenny as, as we go along, um, just pop them into the chat and I'll, and I'll get those in front of him. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I'm going to try and talk, but <laughs> questions will be, will be much easier yeah. to answer. So I have a happiness hour folder here, which Linda was very happy to see, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have a folder here. So I have a bunch of different, different images here that I, I wanted to use to show. I've got, um, first I'm going to show you This is an image taken on the Oregon coast. And I wanna show you my process. Um, this is a raw image and this is a long exposure. This is, I don't have the, the settings, but I think it's somewhere around 350 seconds. You can see all the star trailing uh, up here. So it's a very long exposure. And what I did was I focused in on the foreground because this is my foreground shot. Hey, can you, before you, can you open, there you go. I was yeah. gonna say, can you make it full screen? There you go, thank you. Yeah. Um, oh, how do I, there we go. Okay, so, um, so I focused in on the foreground. This is my foreground shot. Uh, I don't care about the stars up top because I'm going to blend this image with another one that I'm going to take. And let's see, all right. So this is the sky shot. Again, so I, I didn't care about the foreground. I only focused in on the stars and this is also stacked. So I stacked 15 images to create this that has very, very little noise. And um, noise is kind of that, that uh, um, all that static, uh, for lack of better words, in between the stars and so this is the stacked image of the sky. I showed you guys the foreground and the final image was this, when I blended them in using Photoshop. So I was able to grab all the details and the colors um, on the foreground here. And then I was able to blend the sky using masks in Photoshop. And this is a process, this is not, difficult at all. I, I teach these in my, in my workshop. Um, this type of blend is super easy. There's not really any trees. It's, 
you're blending the Milky Way in with the foreground. So, so this is this is probably one of the easier ways to um, to capture the night sky and taking separate images. So, so the sky is 15 images stacked through the program. The foreground is that separate single shot that I used. It was probably somewhere around 640 ISO or so, if I remember. Um, so we're at like 350 seconds, 640, so super low ISO. There are some hot pixels in there that you can see, and that's just from the camera being on for so long. Uh, there are certain ways to get rid of that, but I didn't on this one. Um, okay, so, so that's stacked, and I don't know, do you want to open up? Does anybody have any questions on stacked images? There's, yeah, so there's, well, let's see here. Can you, okay, so the question is, can you share the names of the programs here? So you used Photoshop. So, yeah, so, so if, you're, if you're a PC user, then you're using Sequator, which is S-E-Q-U-A-T-O-R. And those, that's, that's a free program. Um, it's not my favorite, but it's kind of what PCs have to, there, there might be something better out there, but that's what I know for PCs. And um, and then the other one for for Mac users is Starry Landscape Stacker, and that one I believe is forty bucks. It's um, it's it's really easy to use. And if you guys have any questions, if you get it, I mean it's super easy. Um, there's lots of tutorials on how to use it, but you can always drop me a DM uh, if you get it, and then you want to kind of figure out how to use it. But you basically upload those. Uh, I, I tend to find that 15, 12 to 15 images are good for stacking. Sometimes I do eight, uh, sometimes I only do six, but, um, um, but you want to make sure that your composition is the same and your settings are the same. And you're going to take, we'll just use that number 15. Again, you can do anything five to 25. Um, you have to take them simultaneously with no time in between because this program is taking each of, the sky is moving, the earth is moving at 1100 miles per hour or whatever it moves, uh, rotates at. Um, but it appears that the sky is moving. And so, so you, you don't wanna leave any time in between those images. So, so when you're out in the field and you're shooting the Milky Way, you have it all focused in, you have your settings, you're just gonna use your interferometer and go one after the other, or you can just press the button one after the other and make sure your two second timer is on using the butt. So um, how about, um, let's see, um, David Holland wants to know, did you shoot the foreground at the approximate same time as the Milky Way? Yeah, I did. Um, I, I shot the Milky Way first because, um, or I, I can't remember if I shot which one went first, but, um, but typically I'm going to shoot the main event, which is the Milky Way, because you don't know if the fog is going to roll in, if clouds are going to roll in. So you want to make sure that you get that first. You don't want to assume that you're going to have a visual on that Milky Way the whole time you're there, uh, unless you're waiting for it to align. And so I can't remember if I was waiting for it to align, or, um, but, but that's usually my, my, my thinking process. If I needed to align somewhere, then I'll wait, but I'll make sure that I get Milky Way images because the foreground is probably not going to go anywhere. So okay. we can always capture that. Let me get you to end share your screen so that you pop up bigger into the, to the screen. Sure. There you go. Yeah. Uh, Deborah wants to know, what is the advantage of stacking 15 images? Is it amplifying the light signal from starts, stars? Right. Um, no, it's a good question. Uh, it was pro that's probably a question I had in the beginning. I couldn't quite understand. It's just for noise reduction. So it's not going to make your stars any brighter. It's just going to eliminate all of that noise at a really high ISO. Even if you're shooting at 6400 ISO, and it depends on your camera, 6400 ISO might be really high for your camera. You might, it might be very noisy, uh, especially on a crop sensor. So it's really going to depend on your gear. But um, but stacking it is just eliminating the noise. It's not making the stars any brighter. Okay. Um, Susan wants to know, you, you chose 15. Is there a reason that you picked 15? Is that a, was that just the number you had in your mind or is that a formula that works for you? Um, yeah, there, there's, there's not much of a formula for it for me. I'm, uh, 15 is, 15 is a good number. That's typically what I teach 20, 20, 20 frames. Uh, on the safe side, 
but if I'm going to be real in how I shoot, I'm usually stacking like 10 or 12, 12 images, um, sometimes 15. It's, it's really something that, that you can play with and, and find out. I don't see much of a difference. Some people say they do. I don't see much of a difference between, say, 10, 10 frames that are stacked versus 20. Um, but six frames versus versus ten, uh, you, you'll see some you'll see some difference. So you, so ten probably probably a good bare minimum for most people. Okay, Lloyd and Nancy um, are asking what what was your f stop in both of those images that you blended? Yeah, so so the lens I was using was a sixteen to thirty five two point eight. So you wanna you wanna typically choose your fastest um, aperture. So for that lens, it was f two point eight. Uh, I do have other lenses that are 1.8, and sometimes I'll do, if it's a 1.8 lens, I'll do f2. Uh, sometimes you'll find that the, the stars are just a little bit sharper, and you can pull out just a little bit more color out of the night sky, out of the stars. Uh, but typically, you want to be at the low end. If you have an f4 lens, it's, it's going to be really difficult to, to get the exposure proper. And um, not to say you can't do it, but but you're gonna sacrifice a lot of quality. So if you really wanna get serious with, about photographing the night sky, you want something 2.8 or, or, uh, or lower. Um, Vin wants to know, stacking photos of a shot at high ISO um, or tracking at lower ISO for longer shutter speed, which do you think is a better way to capture those colors in the Milky Way? Uh, tracking it is, is, is definitely, um, it's a great question. Uh, this is my tracker. And so this is, for those of you who have not seen a tracker, this is uh, Skywatcher Star Adventurer. This is, um, you basically hook up your um, tripod head right here. You polar align this, right? So you look through this little, this little thing right there. If you can, can, you, can you guys see the North Star? That's, that's what the, uh, that's what you need to look through. So, so you set this up, you polar align it with the North Star, and um, there's a little bit more detail to it, but it's, it's pretty much that simple. And then you, um, you twist on your tripod head right here, and then you have your camera attached to it. And while this is still polar aligned, right? So it's, this, this is pointing towards the North Star, and you have your camera up here, you can, you can move your camera any which way you wanna go. And then, and then you can, track so what tracking is is remember I was telling you the earth rotates at that really high mile per hour 1100 I don't know it could be wrong but somewhere around there uh, this rotates at the same speed of the earth right so I've taken 17 minute long exposures of this bad boy and uh, and the stars are a pin chart um, I shot a lot of my neo wise the comet this year uh, with with the tracker and so so the question was about detail, which, which you can get better colors and detail. And this is, gonna, this, this is gonna allow you to use a much lower ISO. So when I'm tracking for 17 minutes, I'm using ISO 200, you know, and I'm using maybe F3.5. And remember I told you, <clears throat> you wanna be really fast, but, but there's, when you're tracking, it's a different game. You, you, you're able to, you're able to pull out more colors at a, at a slightly higher f-stop and because you're able to go a lot longer because this sucker is just just moving so you're basically stop. saying i need a tracker yeah you do when yeah. it does not need any more gear okay so paul denman wants to know if you're stacking multiple images taken over time how come you're not getting star trails yeah um so so when you're um I think so, so when you're when you're adding those those images to Starry Landscape Stacker, right? Because that's that's the platform, that's the program you're going to use to stack these. Um, the program auto aligns it for you, so you're not going to get you're not going to get star trails because you're the whole purpose for the program is to stack those on top of each other and then eliminate the the static, for, for lack of better words, in between the stars. Um, David Holland wants to know, does the movement of the Milky Way concern you when you stack 15? Um, no, not, not 15. Um, I think I've tried just 
just for the hell of it. Um, I think I've tried like 30 or uh, some, some, some really high amount just because I wanted to see what happened. And I don't remember exactly what happened, but I know that I ran into some issues and I don't remember what exactly the issues were. But uh, 15 is a pretty safe number. If you're shooting them simultaneously, then, then you, know, you, you should be fine as long as there's no time in between where you, know, you, you press the button, you go, you crack a beer open, you crack a few jokes with your friends, and then you press the button again. It's, you might run into some issues there. So, so, so put down the beer. Okay. Yeah. So another question about these 15 images. We're fascinated by 15. So Brenda wants to know, so 15 images are stacked to become one star image. What is the approximately, what is the approximate shutter speed you might start with? Yeah, that's a great question. There's actually a method that I teach um, that's, that's really simple where we're using, okay, I'm gonna try it. Okay, so answer your question. I don't wanna go off on a tangent here. I have, my mind sometimes goes in different directions, but. I'll roll you back. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, but, but the settings for that are typically like, you know, 10,000 ISO, 15 seconds, F2.8 at 16 millimeters. So that's, that's kind of a, a pretty staple uh, setting that I use. Um, however, there, there is a method that I've been using that we've been teaching in our classes uh, that allows people, so if you don't wanna um, go into like, the next step of this, of this video is gonna be like blue hour blending and, and there's lots of other ways to, to do this stuff. But, um, but an easy way while you're stacking is I found that, well, we've, we've worked with different sensors and different cameras, but uh, 6,400 ISO seems to be the magic number when, when we're stacking. So 6,415 seconds at F2.8, um, we, we help bring you through some edits before you put these images through Starry Landscape Stacker or Sequator. And what it does, it really brings up the values and the exposure in your foreground and allows you to not have to shoot separately like I showed you in those examples with the photos, a, a separate foreground shot. And, um, and one of the questions you might be thinking is like, well, what about the focus? This is if, this is if you don't have something like immediately close to you uh, that you need in focus. So this is focused in on the stars, infinity, you have 15 shots, you're 6,400 ISO, you're 15 seconds, uh, you're F2.8, you're, you're wide angle, 16, 20 millimeter, 14 millimeter. And, um, and what we do is um, we bump up, in Lightroom, we bump up exposure, a, a few things, shadows, uh, bring highlights down a little bit, bring whites up. So, so we do a little bit of fine tuning in there. And, and what that does is that, is that um, that brings more information into the foreground. So when we are stacking, we're stacking the sky and it's not moving, but, but through the stacking program, you're choosing what your foreground is also. So you're painting in the sky. So the program knows what the sky is and what the foreground is, right? Because you tell it. And, um, and, and so, so once you run it through that system, now you have an image that is exposed for the foreground and for the sky all in, all in one. So, they, so you don't have to do masking and blending in Photoshop to get that done. So that, that, that is a method that we teach. And um, it's a great method for a lot of people that maybe don't wanna spend a lot of time creating these, these images because there's a lot of uh, planning. So that's where the planning comes in. I'm a planner when it comes to creating images, but, but not so much in, in going to spots and taking a certain photograph that I have a vision for, unless it's like a vision with a cool light source or a human element or something. Okay. There's a lot of questions, but I don't want to run out of time for the rest of the, your, your program. But I'm going to ask this one because this is a, okay, it's a joke. It's a happiness hour. We're all supposed to be happy. But I really, most of my friends call it the Linda's selfish hour because I get to ask what I want to ask. So I don't know how to pronounce your name. So if I mispronounce it, Balaji, you're my hero. How do you get the radiating patterns out in your Milky Way images? How do you post-process them? Um, the radiating. 
I, th I think what he's talking about, it looks like they're zoomed out. If I'm wrong, if that's not what you're thinking, Balaji, type the, type in real quick and I'll get it back in front of him. What I'm the thinking exploding of- Exploding stars, like, like the exploding stars? Exploding, that's what I think he's asking. That's what I want to know. Oh, that's, um, so you can do that two ways. Uh -huh. uh, so Balaji, I'm sorry, I'm only going off of what Linda says. She says your name is Balaji, I'm gonna assume it's and, Balaji. And Linda, and Linda butchers everybody's name, so, you yeah. know. Um, well, the, uh, so, so he, Balaji's asking about, um, about exploding stars. So I have, I have a few images. Uh, one that won an award, yay, go me. Um, <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was my Airstream shot. It was, uh, it was my Airstream and then Ship Rock, which is in New Mexico. And then it was like this uh, exploding sky and that was done in Photoshop. However, um, so that's done. Um, using a radial filter in Photoshop. So you're using a radial filter and instead of it going uh, around, it's, damn, I can't remember the words because it's not in front of me. But, um, but anyway, it's done in Photoshop. But the other method that you can use in camera is you have your lens, right? So let's, let's say you're doing a 20 second exposure because we don't care about star trails, right? Because we want the stars to look like they're, they're exploding. Oh, mm -hmm. Like fireworks. And, 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 um, no, it's okay. And, and, so, and, and so, so what you do is... Twisting your lens or using yeah. your So you keep it there for like 10 of those seconds, right? So you keep it stable. Um, and I can't remember if it's in or out, so you can play with both. If, it's, if you start at 30, you need a zoom lens. So if you start at 35 and then you zoom out to 16, but you do it really slowly. So, so for example, you have your camera, right? You're at 35 millimeter, you have your settings, normal, like you're shooting the Milky Way and you're doing a 20 second exposure or maybe, no, 30 second, 30 second, because you want more, uh, more light in there. So, so you let it go for 10 seconds or 15 seconds and then you start slowly turning uh, your zoom to zoom out. And then you time it so it's perfect. So you do that for the remainder of the 15 seconds. So 15 seconds, it's still the other 15 seconds. You're turning it and then voila, you have these really cool exploding stars. Yeah, I'm totally gonna Photoshop that. <laughs> <laughs> it's really easy to Photoshop too. Really I cool. would knock over my tripod and camera setup. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> no. Do it. If, I ever, if we ever meet someday, we'll we'll do it. You know, we yeah, we you. we'll talk about that when we're at the end of this. Okay, yeah. so uh, Ruth had a question because she's a big fan of uh, Topaz de Noise. Uh, would you use that to help? get rid of some of the noise in your Is photos? Uh, um, it's called to yeah, it's called Topaz de Noise. It's a software that um, helps you reduce the noise in- Who in makes it? Is there, is there a brand that makes it? Um, I think it's, is, I think it's, it's Topaz is what the brand that oh, I'm- that's that brand. I know. Yeah, that's the brand. So, so I think the answer is you probably don't use it. <laughs> I don't use it. Um, to eliminate noise, I stack, I track. Yeah. Uh, th those are the two main main things, and and I do want to show you guys a, a special trick that I use for star reduction. And whenever I say star reduction, and I teach these in, in my workshops, people are always like, "Star reduction? Like, why would I want to? Re I'm, I'm out here to photograph the stars. Why do I want to reduce the stars?" Uh, and and so far, everyone who's seen it is like, "Oh, okay, so it's cool. So we'll eventually get there." That's. Okay. So that, that, that you can also use um, that process to eliminate some of the noise and, um, and also some hot pixels too. We were talking about hot pixels I showed you in the other image. Yeah. That's another selfish question. I, was de I deal with hot pixels all the time. It's yeah, this, this will help you. This, this method will help you Good. for sure. Uh, you could do it just for the foreground if you're familiar, if you're comfortable with layer masking, um, you, can, you can, I'll show you when we get there. Yeah. Okay, one more question. We're gonna to jump to the next uh, segment. So uh, Paul Denman wants to know, do you use focal length decided by the 500 rule to get the amount of time you can shoot to get pinpoint stars? Um, so, so we teach the 500 
um, rule. I don't, I don't ever do the math because I'm, I live for the night sky. So I'm, I'm pretty familiar with, with all the focal lengths and like when I get some star trails and, and I'm actually okay with a little bit of trailing. Um, but, uh, so, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not super, um, I, I take photos and then I look to see if they're, if it's trailing and if it is, then I back off a stop with, uh, with my exposure, with the length of the exposure. Okay. How about we jump to your next segment? I just don't want to run out of. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. um, so, so we talked about, uh, we talked about stacking and that's, um, that's really a majority of, of what I do to create, to eliminate noise. Um, I also do, I don't know if you guys are interested in composition or uh, composites. So I, I do a little mixture of everything. I'm, I'm kind of like spread across the board with, uh, I like composites. I love getting that single shot. When I say single shot, like a blended shot, like I showed you already, where it lines up and you're just blending everything together. Um, but I do a lot of focus stacking and I can share my screen here and I'll show you what I live in. I'll show you where I quarantined this, this past March. I think you guys all know what happened there. Um, share screen. Okay. I'm going to share my screen here. Let's share. Hello. Okay. Um, so now we're going to go into focus stack. with the night sky. And so this is my home. This is what I live in. And that is the final image right there. And so what I did was basically, I, I, I did one exposure with just the sky. Can you, you can see my mouse, right, Linda? I can, can you yep, okay, you're good. Cool. Um, I did another one for just my Airstream, which kind of got, my solar panel here in focus. And then I did another exposure for the cactus. So as you can see, we have everything pretty sharp here. And so, um, and this was, this was the sky. This is the Superstition Mountains. This is right outside of uh, Phoenix. So, so there's a lot of light pollution here. My ISO is probably somewhere around 4,000, 5,000. So I don't even know if I, had to stack this, but I probably did. Um, let me see, I'm gonna make this smaller. And these were just the images that I used. Uh, these were the original images you can see unedited. Um, you can see the stars are really out of focus. And this one, because I'm focused in on the cactus. And here the Airstream is out of focus and the stars are really out of focus. So, so this kind of shows you the importance uh, for me for focus stacking when I do want things to be all in focus. And this is all done through, um, you know, through Photoshop. I do it manually and I use layer masking. And it's, it's, for an image like this, it's not difficult at all. Sometimes with flowers that are moving, it can get quite tedious and, and difficult, but um, that's an example of focus stacking. And that was like super easy. That's being lit by the light pollution in Phoenix. So there was just a lot of like really easy parts about putting that image together. Um, and uh, all right, let's see, we can go into um, composites and then I can, I can ask uh, you guys questions about if you have anything for the focus stacking or with composites, which I think composites you guys will some questions. I'm going to share the screen here again. And let's do these. This was a cool, fun composite. I knew I was going to do it when I took the photo. So this is what I mean about planning. This, this was the blue hour shot and you can see. Kenny, can you make that a big screen? There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is the blue hour image. This is the raw image. You can still see all the wonderful dust speckles on the, on the sensor. Um, but what really shows you that, that it's a long, oh, well, okay, there you go. That's the, um, that's the final image. And I can make this smaller because I, I wanted to show you in this, 
you can see over here, you can see the light trail. So this is about a 30 second exposure. This is during blue hour. Um, this is when I like to do a lot of my blue hour blends. And what we're doing is we're basically taking the sky and we're replacing it with the, um, the stars. And so I took, I took this shot uh, on the Oregon coast and sorry, I'm trying to, there we go. And this is, this does not line up. This is a true composite, nothing lines up. This is not, this is kind of rare. A lot of my stuff typically, even if I do a composite, it's something that lines up, but this does not. And um, I used Photoshop to add in the reflection here. Uh, I used tracked Milky Way for my 55 millimeter lens. And I used the star reduction so you can see you just have all the colors. Why does it do that? Um, you have all the colors in the Milky Way. And, and there's, there's no distractions with, with some other stars. So, so you're able to just really focus on all the different colors, which, which for me, I, I really like. So, um, so what do we got? We got any questions? Not on those things, but we have, I'm collecting questions on the stacking. That's still, yeah, seems okay. to be, everybody's, you, yeah. Do you want me to go back to those or do you want to move on and we'll. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Let's, 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 okay. let's, uh, I'm going to share my screen while we're doing this, uh, while you're at, um, can you see my screen now? Um, uh, I'm going to say no, cause I'm looking at my screen. Yeah, I can see your screen now. But okay. they'd rather see your face during questions. So go ahead and go back to your face. Well, no, I, th I think they'd rather see this. So this is oh, okay. the landscape stacker. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna just go through and see if I can. I didn't plan on doing anything, uh, but let's see if I let's go into Oregon. Uh, oh, what? Oh, I don't have that. Hold on. Uh, but go on, you can ask uh, a okay. question and, okay. and I'm just going to look for something that I can stack here. I think I have the wrong. All right. go, go ahead. I'm gonna so David out. Wilson has a question. Um, is star reduction related to nebulosity? Ooh, nebulosity. I don't even know what nebulosity is, but it's okay. Good. Cause I didn't either. And I thought oh, I'm so stupid. <laughs> no, no. Um, I don't know what that is. David, do you want to break it down? Break it down, David. Okay, so um, so is infinite focusing the best way to pick up detail without a tracker? Um, so so infinite focusing, which which I'm assuming is is just picking a spot, uh, picking the infinity spot on your lens that that shows you that infinity symbol is not the best way. Uh, you really want to fine tune with your eyeballs because it may not be. Um, it, it, the proper focusing spot on your lens may not be the actual infinity. It might be, it might be a different section there. So, um, so just because you turn to infinity doesn't mean that, that you are shooting infinity. And you've got to really fine tune, fine tune that. Okay. Adrian's asking, do you synchronize those shots that you edit before you stack? Do I synchronize? No. Um, Sorry, Landscape Stacker does the synchronizing. So you export them as JPEGs. No, I'm sorry. You export them as TIFFs. Sorry, I'm thinking time lapses. You export them as TIFFs, and then you open them up uh, through Starry Landscape Stacker, and then um, it stacks them all. So you, so you take your 15 shots, right? We're just using the number 15. You can take every many you want. But you take those 15 shots, and you export them as TIFFs and, and then you bring them into Starry Landscape Stacker and then basically does the rest. You choose the sky, you choose the foreground and then you press align and composite and then uh, in a few minutes you have a stacked Milky Way sky. Okay. Um, Lynn wants to know, do you include dark shots or the black shots with your star shots? No, people do that to, um, to eliminate the hot pixels and that, that is the method. I've actually never used that method, so I couldn't really shed any light either which way on it. 
but that is a method that people use. So you end up taking, um, you know, if you take 15, 15 frames, 15 shots of, of the Milky Way, you take 15 with the lens cap on dark frames, those are considered dark frames with the same exact setting. So if you're doing 15 seconds, blah, 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 then you do 15, uh, 15 shots with the exact same settings and then you, um, you incorporate those into your stacking and that can eliminate, you know, but, but I've never done it. So, okay. so hot pixels. So uh, Angie wants to know, and I'm with Angie, what causes them and yeah. how can you avoid them? And then I'm going to add on, I got a bunch of them. How do I get rid of them? Well, you, uh, what causes them is your sensors heating up um, and being used extensively. So when you're in high, hotter temperatures so man when i'm shooting astro at night in like you know not in las vegas but somewhere in the desert out there then it's it's near impossible to avoid it the dark frames is one way I'm, i don't i don't use that but um but but the method that i can show you um in photoshop is one way to get rid of some of the hot pixels and uh i'm not I'm not super technical on what causes them. I know it's just heating up the sensor and, and just being. It's good enough for us. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. We just want, I just wanted to know, you know, yeah. something that I could. What am I doing wrong? Okay, no. so Angie, hopefully that'll answer your. Oh, so how do you get rid of them in Photoshop? I I cloned them out the other night. Oh, geez, that's, that's a lot of work. It was. Yeah. <laughs> I only know two. I only know two tools. That's one of them. Okay. Do you want to do you want to tell us what your what the easiest way is, or can you? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna take. Um, let's see. I think I have. Um, I'm trying to get a, a photo ready, but if you want to kick me with another, okay, you got sure. any questions yeah. there? Yeah, I we got a couple more. Um, <laughs> Oh, this was, uh, so some, ca this is Robert asking, some, some cameras need, need, I cannot talk tonight, some cameras need to process each image internally that cause noise reduction limit. Let me start over. So, I, I, I understand this question. Okay, good. So, um, oh, Tell I'm us sorry. what the question is, because I can't, I'm looking yeah. at it and I can't even read it. Uh -huh. who, who is asking? Robert. Robert. Okay. So, so Robert, um, I, I don't, I don't know why the camera companies send you a camera with, with this as your, as your default, but, uh, I'm, I'm sure some of you are shaking your head and know exactly what I'm talking about. It's the noise reduction, um, button on your, on your camera. It's in your, it's in your menu. It's totally useless. Uh, I shouldn't say it's useless cause it does do something, but, but what it does, nobody ever uses. So I don't know one single person on the planet that uses the noise reduction is like, yeah, yeah, that, that noise reduction that, that, that makes my camera go black for, uh, for the exact same amount of time that I use to, to take the photo is, is the bomb. Yeah. No, says nobody. So, so no, you want to turn that off. <laughs> Everybody, you want to turn that off. And, and, and if you haven't, and if you don't know what I'm talking about, go into your menu, look for noise reduction. Um, it should be and and just turn it off do yourself a favor because one day you're gonna be annoyed by this and not know why yeah so Marilyn wants to know um, oh actually good question Marilyn you mentioned star reduction but did you explain that I don't remember you explaining it no not yet because I'm okay so it's yeah. coming up okay. yeah um, really important question is that a Bambi Airstream you damn right it is <laughs> it's uh it's a 16 foot bambi uh it's 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 very small yeah. okay here we go uh what camera do you use for your milky way images yeah um i use a sony a7r3 and um uh typically my my astro lens my drug of choice is the 16 to 35 2.8 but i am drooling over sony just released a 12 to 24 2.8 that I would maybe 
sell my dog. No, I'm just kidding. I would not. I would never sell you, Sabu. But um, wow, some, ouch. Some, <laughs> No, it's, uh, uh, but yeah, that, that's hopefully going to be my next, I need to sell a few more workshops, but yeah, that's what I use. Okay. So are you taking, um, your shot early in the blue hour and put pu and pulling back on the highlights or waiting until closer until the blue hour is over? Oh, that's a good question. Okay. It's an advanced question. So, so the question's asking about, um, what I'm blending the night sky with blue hour and, and I, I think what you're asking is when do I typically like to take the blue hour in the beginning or at the end? And I like, I like photographing the end of blue hour because a lot of my shots are, are very moody and dark. And, and I like that dark, the information from, from a darker frame. Um, and then it's easier then to bump up the highlights and the whites because when you're blue hour blending, you're using a luminosity mask, which is basically Using, um, using, using the highlights in your sky in the blue hour blend, right? Because the sky is still much brighter than everything else. So, you, so you're taking the brightest parts of that image and you're replacing it with a different sky, which is going to be your Milky Way. And then you blend colors together. Uh, you make sure the colors match with the sky and the foreground. And then those dark tones are just a little bit easier for me to blend. And I just, I just like my work to be a little bit darker, so. There's another question buried in here. Let's see. What white balance do you find best for star photography? Oh, that's, man, it's always different. And uh, I'm, I'm not a person that does the same thing over. Um, so I'm, I'm not a habitual person. So everything is, is tailored to what I see in real time. So uh, Kelvin 3700 is, is pretty good. So if I had to pick something, I'd probably just say, I'd switch it to Kelvin 3700, but to be honest, I'm changing it all the time. My mood is changing. I, I like different things. So I'm playing with all different white balances or I'm just using auto white balance. It's just, it's, it's always so different with me. Sorry, I wish there was like a, a, a specific like, <laughs> out of you. Oh my goodness. Um, so Matt Smith uh -huh. <laughs> is in the room. And he wants to know what settings does he need to grow a beard like you? Yeah, so, so it, it has to be really man, manly settings. And um, uh, you, you need a manly camera with a, with a manly um, uh, tripod, a very manly tripod. And, I, um, I told him to come tonight so that he could heckle you. So Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so why don't you jump into your next bit? I can see it. It's All good. right, cool. I think I have. Um, okay, so. All right. So, oh, this is my ninety. Okay, so these are all track shots. These are all raw images, unedited. Um, this is the full screen. I'm just gonna kind of go through. This is a wide angle. I don't remember if it was probably sixteen, but we can. Let's see. I wanted to find a 55 if I have, okay, here we go. So here's a 55, but this is not, here, this is the unedited, okay. So we're gonna send this over to Photoshop. And what I'm gonna show you guys is, sorry, it's taking so long, is the star reduction, which you can also use Linda, to, um, to get rid of some of your hot pixels. And it's not going to get rid of all of them, but it's going to cut your cloning time in half that you were taking out all of your hot Don't be pictures. making fun of me. Um, well, while it's loading, here's some other images for your, for your pleasure. Um, this is all recent stuff from Rainier. But I'm waiting for this. Let's try it again. But this will be a really good method. Um, there we go. Okay. Just gonna get rid of this. I've got timeline check there. All right, so here is 55 millimeter Milky Way. And a very simple way. So everybody, 
um, screen record, get your phone out, record this. Yeah, actually this is being recorded, so. No, I'll you can come through, okay. Yeah. But, um, but if you just here for this, then uh, what I like to do is go to noise and then dust and scratches. Okay. And you can see I've got, I've got something already in here, two and 84. Again, I'm not a habitual guy, so I'm gonna play with different numbers, but this is a good place to start. I might do a radius of three and then the amount of pixels. So you can see as we're changing that, um, so we'll go 90 pixels and now we have some, some more stars. I'm gonna zoom out so you can see, let's just say we do like, my normal go-to is like three and 60. Okay, so let's just use that. Oh, I should have probably made a copy so we can see, hold on. Three and Z, I'm gonna make a copy. We're gonna go up here again, we're gonna go to filter, we're gonna go to noise, we're gonna go to dust and scratches. And the settings are gonna be there from what I just had up there, radius of three, threshold of 60. Okay, and so, so now what it's done is it's gotten rid of some of those little stars out there. And so do you, do you, see, how, do you see how the Milky Way, the colors and, and those gases just pop now? Mm -hmm. It's also going to get rid of hot pixels too. So if, if you just wanted to affect your foreground, right? Let, let's just say magically that that we just wanted to affect the bottom half of this, right? We can, hold on, I gotta move our little bar here. Um, we create a layer mask here, right? So I'm gonna create a layer mask by clicking this little rectangle. And then I'm going to choose a brush, right? I'm gonna make sure that it's black because I'm gonna be painting on white and my opacity is 100. Okay, so I'm going to make my brush a little bit bigger. And remember, I just want, I'm not painting yet. I want, like, imagine this is our horizon right here. And I only want the foreground to be affected because we're getting rid of those hot pixels. I'm gonna paint back in the sky here. And so now you can see I've painted in, I'm not painting anymore, but I painted in up here and I've left down here. So if we toggle this on and off, you could see now only the bottom is affected. So Linda, if you're, if you're, if you're working on an image that your foreground has a whole bunch of hot pixels and you just want to get rid of them in your foreground, you can try this and this will eliminate some of them. Does that make sense? No, but that's why it's recorded and that's why <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> you can help me next time. Yeah, so, so so we're just imagining that this isn't the Milky Way anymore, right? I'm not, I'm not painting anything. I'm just using my mouse so you can see. This is no longer the Milky Way. The bottom half is your foreground of maybe some rocks and some water that have a whole bunch of hot pixels. Mm -hmm. And so we use that filter, blur, um, I'm sorry, noise, dust and scratches, and then we did that, I'm gonna press cancel. Um, but then we created a layer mask and then we painted back in the sky, right? Because down here is the foreground. This is your rocks and all that. This is the stuff with all the hot pixels that you don't want. So you just using the dust and scratches for the bottom half of your image. So you're able to paint back in uh, everything to look as it did before. So you're able to mask all this, the sky out, so. That's that. So I'm gonna stop sharing and say hi. Hi. All right. Let's see. I don't think I have any new questions. Okay. Oh wait, I do. I'm sorry, I do. Yeah. Um. Let's see. Oh well, this is more of a, a travel question. What sky would you like to do most? Atacama Desert or Patagonia? <laughs> Guess who hasn't researched either one of those to give you, um, if I, <laughs> if I don't I even get, know where Atacoma is and I travel a lot, but I would love to go to Patagonia. Yeah. Well, so Patty, I, I would opt to not because 
the first spot, I didn't know where it was. So I would want to go there because Patagonia I've, I've seen. So I want to go somewhere I haven't seen and, and just explore. So uh, I did that in Sweden, um, yeah. to go topic, but I did that in Sweden. I was out there for a month and I was on snowmobiles and I got to explore all these places that nobody's photographed before because they're just in the middle of nowhere. And, and it was like, yeah. that's what, that's what I love. That's what I'm passionate about. All right. So um, I don't have anything else here. How about you? What else do you have to cover? Um, composites we did. Uh, oh, we can do, okay. I can show you just an example of like a pano composite and a, a place where the Milky Way does line up. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna share the screen here. Thank you. Um, so when I took this image, I knew exactly what I was gonna do with it. I was going to turn it into a composite. This is a blue hour shot. You can see even the stars up here. So this was taken um, while there still was some light. There were some stars in the sky, but I was able to get. Uh, this was a very long exposure. I don't know. I don't remember how long, but maybe five minutes. Uh, and yeah, it was, it was not windy, as you can see. So um, I'm going to show you then I took this and I knew I was going to do a panoramic, right? And so this was the uh, final image. So I, I, I took that foreground and then I knew I wanted to add this Milky Way and then I added this kind of dreamy fog. And this is just sometimes this was during quarantine and I was bored. So, <laughs> so this, this is uh, just, just another way to get you thinking with, with composites and having fun with, with photography. All right. Let me see what else I got any in this happiness hour. If there was anything else I wanted to go over. This was another, okay. So I'm going to show you guys a tracked, a tracked shot attract panoramic shot and let's see this was the foreground all right so I um my buddy and I my my business partner uh, with photo roamers so we're we teach um we teach workshops as I said our, our business name is photo roamers and this is my buddy Ryan I'll make that bigger so you can see this is my buddy Ryan he's standing out on the cliff there with his lights I'm on the phone with him and I'm I'm telling him where to shine shine the lights and this was kind of the, the hot spot that I really liked. You can see the Milky Way up here. So this is just a single image, but I was shooting for the foreground. And then separately, I took my tracker out because I wanted to get track milk from, from that area. And where are you at, happiness? There we are. All right, so here's, here's the tracked Milky Way. And you can see it's tracked because the sky is, is standing still, but the foreground, you can see how it's, you can see how it's kind of wispy there and it's out of focus and it's blurred because um, everything in the sky is going to be stable with that sky track, with the Skywatcher um, Star Adventure. And, um, and I'll show you guys the final image because I ended up doing a panoramic so I was able to use more of the Milky Way and make this more into a square scene. And this was the, the final shot. So you're getting a little bit of air glow down here. That's the green. And you're getting all that detail in the Milky Way and the star, the star reduction to, to really just bring your eyes to all those colors. So the question here is, how did you get the center of the Milky Way to stand out in that one? In this. Um, there's different editing, editing techniques um, that I use. I use some luminosity masks in Photoshop. Uh, I do some dodging, some burning. I use a lot of curves adjustments. And um, that's how I bring the light up. And I just do color correcting in, in Lightroom. So I, I make sure that the temperature is where I want it to be. And I don't add colors into the Milky Way. So I just, I just bring in the colors that are there. Um, there was a question earlier. Can you tell us what the, your star tracker, what brand that is or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and like not to make a commercial, but if you guys send me a DM, I can get you 10% off cause I work with these guys. So it's, um, it's a Skywatcher. 
That's probably backwards. No, it's fine. Sky Watcher, Star Adventurer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure how much. I think they're somewhere around uh, three to five hundred dollars. I think they're like four hundred, but um, so so definitely, you know, shoot me a DM. I have a code. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'll send it to you, and then you can get ten percent off of it, which is a nice little. You know. Okay. Okay. What else you have? Is that about it? I think I think that's it. Um, for my happiness. I'm, yeah. So I'm looking really quickly. There were a lot of questions earlier that I think I hit most of them. So with that, I'm going to kind of uh, close this out. Um, any any final words? Oh no, there's another final one. word. Oh man, yeah, I didn't even think about it. That, that, like, that, yeah, the gems that you know, the wisdom of Kenny as he's on the road. Yeah. Um, well, I'm like an open book. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions. I'm, I'm not so great at, at, uh, at final words. Um, All right. Let me ask you this. When's the best time to see the Milky Way? The very best time. Uh, during new moon or, or when the moon sets. Uh, you, don't, you don't want any moonlight out there. Yeah. And so the cycle when the moon is rising during the day and setting you know, before sunset. Or, uh, that's, that's a great time. And, and I think it starts, um, I think it starts around like February or March, you start to get a little sliver of, of the Milky Way. Before. And then, um, and then as the months progress, like once, once you're in like late spring and, and early summer, you're just getting like July, July is probably the best. Because I was gonna say April to July, April to August seems to be what the guys that I shoot with are like, let's go. Um, see here uh i'm going to uh let's 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 tell people what you do because this is how i ran across you was on instagram and um if you guys aren't following him on instagram please check him out because this is a great time to do some armchair traveling because his my stories are a lot of fun on instagram so he's at k r l and it's kenneth r la rose right yeah. k r l underscore photo and his website and he partners with another guy named ryan how do you how does i don't know how to pronounce his last name oswald Os yeah it's ryan oswald but, it, oswald. but we just call him ryan oswald. just ryan okay and they're with photoroamers.com so they offer workshops they do one-on-one -on -one, um tutorials um and because you know he's he's mobile so he's really traveling with the seasons because he comes through texas usually at least when i watch you you're here during wildfire season and i know that you have workshops so yeah. uh, you were in oregon earlier this um summer and now you're kind of in washington so i guess you hit hit one border and you come back the other way is that is that the deal yeah again i'm not a planner so yeah. Um, the only things I plan around are, are my workshops or if, or if you schedule something with me and I'm completely reliable, but, yeah. um, but outside of that, I'm, I kind of just go wherever the wind takes me, um, wherever the conditions are, if wildflowers are popping up somewhere. Um, so, so I, I, I travel full time and, and, and going with the seasons is important because of my dog, uh, yeah. And, and going into the photo roamers, I make a living through through workshops. We also offer Zoom sessions too, where I can take control of your computer. But for the most part, I do a lot of screen sharing um, and run through. I think uh, there was there was someone in here that had done a Zoom session with me before. Probably so. There's probably a lot of people in here. Um, um, so yeah. So I'm because I'm I'm more interested in international travel. So where's your next internet? when we can travel. I know you yes. went to Sweden last year. We kind of, we didn't cross paths, but we were very close. Uh, I was, uh, where were we? Italy. I was oh, yeah. in Italy, wow. yeah. And I, he, you either sent me a message or I sent you and I'm not sure. It's like, are you in Italy? Cause you'd, you had been in yeah. Switzerland, I believe. Yeah. 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 And so we were actually, I think we were probably like, within 20 miles of each other. And yeah. I was like, dude, I can't, I can't meet up. I've got to get on a plane, but yeah. Wh what's your, what's your next European or your next international trip? Um, so, so Sweden, we're, we wanted to do two and we, we still may depending on traveling. 
um, restrictions. But but Sweden is by far the untapped. It's incredible. We're doing uh, um, hopefully two back-to-back -back workshops out there. Um, it's basically a helicopter picks you up at the airport, takes you to uh, to the location. Uh, food's all included, lodging. I know it sounds like a commercial, but I freaking love Sweden. And um, and we're taking snowmobiles every day to all the different locations. So you have these these um, frozen rivers and this crazy wind with snow. It's so cold. You but it doesn't matter because the aurora is blowing everywhere. You get about five hours, six hours of daylight uh, each day, but all six hours you can shoot because the sun is low on the horizon. And it's just, it's, it's just heaven out there. And um, I can't wait to, to be able to, to go back there and be able to teach out there. Yeah. And guys, that's why I'm, I, I live on Instagram and I, I've met some really cool people doing that, but watching people's my stories you kind of see where they are and then within a day or two you get to see the photos that they create so it's a it's a great way to kind of travel along with somebody and um, i i highly encourage it i love it so it, it gives me ideas it makes me kind of think where do i want to go next and and that's part of this thing is getting inspired so for me you do that with the traveling and i i love that so thank you yeah, yeah. Thanks, All right, guys, I'm going to uh, kind of close this out. So, all right, mm. that being said, Kenny, thank you so much for, for coming on. And I know we hit you with a lot of questions, but those are things that we all kind of want to know. And, and this was a great resource. You're a great resource for us. Oh, thanks. And, and I mean, if you want to open it up, if anybody has any more questions, I'm happy to, to hang for a few more minutes. If, yeah. Uh, so let me close out the recording. Yeah. And so, all right. So we were just talking travel. So I know that I can't be the only one that's disappointed that my travel plans are sidelined this year. So next week, I have an award-winning travel photographer named Matt Payne, who's gonna share his insights on how to make sure you get the most out of your next travel adventure. His session is gonna be called A Minute Longer, Lessons in Travel Photography. So. Thank you for joining us tonight, and until next Wednesday, go out and create something beautiful, and I hope that we will see you again next week.